Juliet Morgan was born on February 21, 1914, in an upper middle class house near Montgomery, Alabama. She was an only child of Frank and Lila Morgan. She was raised into a family which society considered to be privileged and high class, giving her the nickname a Southern Belle. Juliet's mother, Lila Morgan, was a very egotistical, self-centered, and spoiled woman. She expected too much of Juliet and blamed her for all of the family problems. This made Juliet grow up to be a more emotionally insecure and develop a very sensitive, melancholic, and quiet personality. She was also raised by an African American woman, as was custom back then, but still distanced her even more from her mother. However, these childhood struggles did not stop Juliet from becoming extremely successful in her educational life. Morgan was exceedingly intelligent, making her graduate from high school at the age of 15 and from college at the age of 17. She graduated from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa with a degree in literature and political science. One year later, she returned to earn her master's degree, later finding a job as a librarian and high school teacher. After graduating from college, Morgan gradually grew busier. She joined Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal Club, the Southern Conference Educational Fund, and Alabama's Council on Human Relations, in which she was one of the few white members. Within a few weeks, Morgan joined the International Women's Prayer Group, the Fellowship of the Concerned. Because white churches wouldn't allow the group to use their facilities, the group meeting had to be held in African American churches. It was about this time in Juliet's life when she started noticing more racial injustice and thus gradually starting her quiet stand. For unknown reasons, Juliet suffered from anxiety attacks. As a result, she was unable to drive herself to her own destinations, so she rode the bus. She would frequently witness unjust, sometimes extremely cruel acts toward black people on and off the bus. Juliet was horrified partially because there wasn't much she could do being a soft-spoken woman in the 1930s. She had recently read about Gandhi's nonviolent protests in India and was inspired to do something about this injustice. Even if the something didn't even make a difference, it was simply the right thing to do. One particular time a black woman was trying to get on the bus. She paid her fare and then exited the bus to re-enter in the colored section. But when she got off the bus, the driver started to pull away. Julia immediately got up, pulled the emergency cord, and demanded that the driver let the woman back on the bus. From that point on, Morgan saw any injustice treatment of any African American. She would repeat the same action. Sometimes she would have to walk a mile or more to get to work or home from work. Juliet's father was good friends with Grover Hall Sr., who happened to own the Montgomery Advisor which was a local newspaper industry. As a result of this, Juliet was able to easily get letters and personal opinions into the newspapers. Thus, Juliet came to enjoy expressing her opinion publicly a lot. On pen and paper. During World War II, she wrote supporting a wartime federal ballot to permit overseas servicemen to vote. In 1948, Morgan expressed boldly that the federal government get involved and eliminate segregation. Now all of this did not come without consequence. Throughout the time Juliet was beginning to speak up, she received a large amount of criticism. People yelling at her on the street, not being allowed in some stores or restaurants, and hate mail became common occurrences for Juliet. She even lost her job, but remarkably this did not stop her. She found another job in the local library and kept on writing. Soon came the Brown vs. Board educational case, which stated that segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. The people of Alabama ignored the case. In response, Juliet wrote, I am a southerner by accident of birth and ancestry since before 1620, and white so far as I know, not by profession or persuasion. I think that segregation is an evil thing which has limited our horizons and dwarfed our souls. How can the United States face the world with full confidence in her own moral position, 
so long as we have this moral blot on us. After the famous bus boycott where Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to the white bus driver, which consequently sent her to jail, Morgan wrote the following letter to the editor, and it was published in the Montgomery Advisor. The Negroes of Montgomery seem to have taken a lesson from Gandhi. Their own task is greater than Gandhi's, however, for they have a greater prejudice to overcome. One feels that history is being made in Montgomery these days. It is hard to imagine a soul so dead, a heart so hard, a vision so blind and provincial as not to be moved with admiration at the quiet dignity, discipline, and dedication with which the Negroes have conducted their boycott. Juliet was really starting to make some people mad. They started to target more than just Juliet herself with their criticisms, too. Most of Juliet's friends tended to lay low and stay out of harm's way. However, there were one or two people that did take some flack for defending her. Her boss at the library would not fire her because she believed in Juliet's right to freedom of speech. But I suppose the woman could only take so much. Because after Juliet's letter she wrote about Rosa Parks, her boss made her promise to tone it down a little, or otherwise look for alternate occupational options. Which after what Juliet had done was pretty much impossible. So in other words, she could keep quiet, or she could speak her mind and have some personal peace and lose her job. She couldn't keep completely to herself, or she would go crazy. So she continued to write letters, but they were kept personal and not published. There was this man named Bufford Boone. He was pro-integration. He was invited to this white citizens council in Tuscaloosa. He begged them to stop the violence. They booed and heckled him, but he still printed his remarks in the paper the next day. Morgan saw what he said and decided to write him a personal letter of support. The letter's main idea was agreeing with him to stop the violence and supporting desegregation. But she did not hold anything back in this letter. She made it clear what she thought of many elected officials, a few southern white men, and some newspaper editors. She ended it with, It is now time to get on with the job we have put off for far too long. Full citizenship, equal rights, and respect for all people. Bufford Boone liked Juliet's letter and asked her if he could publish it. She thought of her boss and how the harassment towards her had stopped. It was very risky, but her consciousness just couldn't let her say no. The letter was published with no editing. It only went downhill from there. She received prank phone calls, hate mail, silent treatment from dear friends, Many people turned in their library cards, and even her own mother told her she was ashamed of her. The next day, the KKK burned a ten-foot cross in her front yard. An old friend barged into the library and demanded she be fired. After this, Juliet ran to the nearest phone and tried to call her dear friend, who happened to be busy at the time. So instead, she just sat in the phone booth and wept and wept. Juliet's panic attacks returned. She isolated herself and fell into depression. Her doctor gave her shock treatments, but when her blood pressure rose, he prescribed depressant, addictive drugs with strong side effects. She became confused, restless, and almost anorexic. After a few days of this, Juliet's mother called the library and told them that Juliet resigned. A friend of Morgan's took her to the doctor, but there was no one available, so they scheduled an appointment for the next day. But the next day, Juliet's mother found her dead in her bedroom. Juliet Hampton Morgan had been standing up for justice all her life, and the world had finally gotten the better of her. After her death, Juliet's mother and several of her friends dedicated their lives to Juliet's cause, and before long, justice was won. And yes, Juliet Hampton Morgan's quiet but extremely brave stand had made a difference.